Um, we uh, are in the exciting position of celebrating the centenary of the Russian Revolution, uh, the great event of human, the first greatest event in human history. And uh, we expect to have a, a very exciting panel because we're all concerned not only about the past, but about the future. And uh, the panel is organized by myself and some other Marxist-Leninists. And uh, we, the organizers, want to uh, claim the tradition of the Russian Revolution and Marxism-Leninism and the need for a vanguard party. Other people on the panel similar, some have a similar view. Uh, and also to uh, discuss Soviet socialism in a dialectical manner in which we have a fairly positive view of the history of the socialist uh, development in Russia to claim its achievements and its, its, its goals and attempts, but also to look at the differences, uh, how we look at it today from a contemporary perspective and in terms of what the needs of building uh, socialism for the future. And uh, we have some very expert uh, panelists, uh, and um, I will introduce them now. Uh, we first are going to have August Mintz from the University of Minnesota, uh, then we will have Grover Fur from Montclair University, and then Alexander Uzdalen from Moscow State University, and finally Abhinav Sinha, uh, who is here from India, who is the editor of a publication uh, translates as Workers' Bugle, and I will say more about them uh, as I introduce them. Uh, you've probably seen them <coughs> in the program already. So, is it August back? Oh, August, right in front of me. <laughs> August? I will introduce August first. Um, we're very happy to have him. Uh, <coughs> August is a professor of political science and African American and African studies. He's a distinguished teaching professor, as I said, at the University of Minnesota. He's the author of Marx and Engels, Their Contribution to Democratic Breakthrough, and also Marx, Tocqueville, and Race in America, The Absolute Democracy or Defiled Republic, and many articles in different volumes and journals. And I think he's speaking a couple of times here uh, at the Let's Forum, so you can uh, here again. Uh, thanks to uh, David uh, Laveman of Field Articles in uh, Science and Society. <laughs> and you'll be speaking again. And David, there are three panels. If we got our flyer on the Russian Revolution that we talked about, and David will tell you about this later, which August is also on, and Alexander is also on. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank Manny for uh, inviting me to be a part of the, uh, the panel. And uh, he asked me to say a few words about the impact that the uh, Bolshevik Revolution had in the United States. And uh, so I want to focus on, so I, I guess it's appropriate I'm going first to deal a little bit with deep history, and other people can bring it up to, can bring it up to, uh, to date. As was the case uh, throughout the world, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution had a major, major impact on the, on the left, radical forces throughout the world and the birth of uh, communist parties. Uh, it came out of, out of the Bolshevik Revolution. The United States was, uh, uh, was no exception. And it's important to understand uh, the context uh, of the revolution, just as was true within Russia uh, in the United States, the First World War. The First World War is really, I think, the appropriate context for understanding uh, the Bolshevik Revolution and its impact uh, in the United States. Just a little bit of background. At, uh, prior to the Bolshevik Revolution in the United States, just a brief outline of some of the major tendencies of political parties in the United States. Uh, the largest of them, of course, was the Socialist Party, which was uh, formed in 19, 1901. And its uh, most prominent uh, spokesperson, of course, was uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene B. Debs. And the uh, Socialist Party um, attracted an extremely amazing amount of uh, attention. As people know, that uh, Debs ran for president on a number of occasions. The, the only avowed socialist in the history of the United States, in the United States, who ran as 
is socialist, ran as a socialist, and got as many votes uh, as he as he did. The uh, <coughs> but the Socialist Party uh, was an amalgamation of many many different kinds of uh, tendencies uh, all over the, the political map. And that's one of the reasons that uh, shortly after the formation of the Socialist Party, another organization came into existence, uh, the Industrial Workers of the World in 1905. Those who wanted to make a revolution. Uh, their strategy was, of course, through the general strike uh, and in forming industrial and industrial unions. Uh, and oftentimes, like anarcho-syndicalists, as was the case with the IWW, in many ways it was a reaction to what it perceived to be the reformist orientation of socialist, social democratic parties, uh, substituting, in their opinion, putting too much focus on politics as opposed to action, as opposed to the general, the general strike. And that's why the IWW uh, was, was born in uh, 19, 1905. Fast forward to uh, 1914, uh, when the First World, World War broke out. Uh, that posed all kinds of questions for progressive forces in the United States. What position to take on the first on the First World War? So it brought together pacifist forces, reformist forces, revolutionary forces, and within the Socialist Party, all of those tendencies reflected themselves within within the Socialist uh, Party itself, and it reflected uh, one of the characteristics, <coughs> one of the weaknesses of the Socialist Party, in the name of unity bringing together an amalgamation of people who really had different opinions about how to respond uh, to, the, uh, to the First World War, what positions, what positions to, uh, to take in the name of unity. Uh, that became an issue when the United States entered uh, the war. When the United States decided to go into the First World War in April of, 19, April of 1917. Uh, that uh, really alarmed and revealed these tensions and differences within the within the socialist uh, within the socialist party. I only learned recently, by the way, that one of the things that uh, Wilson was able to do was to use the February uh, Revolution, the overthrow of the Tsar, as an excuse to bring the United States into the war in the name of helping the Russian of the Russian people helping to advance the revolutionary process uh, in, uh, in Russia. So that, once the U.S. goes into the war and so all of the anti-war forces uh, have to take a position. And taking a position on the war and so you know, increasingly, increasingly fragmented, fragmented the socialist, uh, the socialist party. <clears throat> in October, November, uh, for revolutionary forces throughout the world, including the United States, in the Soviet Party, the Russian Revolution was a breath of fresh air. The Bolshevik Revolution was a breath of fresh air. There's nothing like success. There's nothing like success. Taking power. Taking state power. And this is what happened. The Bolshevik Revolution. For anybody who has re revolutionary attendance, who had come to the conclusion, we've got to make a revolution, we've got to make a revolution. Uh, this is what the Bolshevik Revolution uh, uh, demonstrated. So over at, in the aftermath, you begin to see a regroupment uh, of, of political forces within the, uh, within the United States. And then out of that regroupment uh, will eventually emerge the first Communist Party uh, in the United States by 1920, 19, 1919, 1920, 1921. That process of bringing the, uh, uh, the Communist Party into existence of, uh, in the US. But just a little bit about the impact to give you a feel for Again, it's, uh, exactly because of the Tsar, I mean, this is the 300 year Romanov uh, dynasty of some, which, uh, was seen as the greatest obstacle to, uh, to social development probably anywhere in the world. And uh, everyone applauded, uh, obviously, except, <coughs> except for the bourgeoisie itself. And, the monarchists and applauded the overthrow of the of the uh, of the Tsar. So the, the Russian the February Revolution really puts Russia in a very different light uh, to progressive forces uh, around the world and especially here uh, in, in the United States. And when the Bolshevik Revolution happens, this is really increases 
the attraction uh, of developments in Russia, again, because the Bolshevik Revolution, and this is the first successful uh, revolution in, in human history. Keep in mind that we've never had any examples of this before. The, the Paris Commune, the working class only held power for two and a, two and a half months. Uh, June 9, 1848, the uh, working class was not even able to, uh, to hold power. So the, the Bolshevik Revolution is really the first successful workers, workers re revolution. So yeah, it's very, very uh, attractive. So uh, uh, sympathizers, supporters of the Russian Revolution have began to mobilize in the United States. And one of the first solidarity, well, those of us who did work around solidarity, activism in Central America and so on, know what can imagine what happened. All kinds of solidarity groups came into existence. And the most influential one uh, was uh, right after the Bolshevik Revolution, was known as Friends, Friends of the Russian, of the Russian Revolution. That's the first one. And then uh, by uh, January 1918, uh, the question was increasingly posed by supporters of the Bolshevik Revolution, why won't the Wilson government recognize recognize the, uh, the government in, uh, in Moscow. So the demand then becomes uh, recognition, and the reckon, demand that the Washington recognize the Bolshevik. That became the leading, the leading slogan among supporters of developments that were taking place uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, when Wilson decides, uh, uh, however, to go after the Bolsheviks and uh, to begin sending U.S. troops and to send arms and so on to help the counter-revolutionary armies, and then the man shifts, hands off Soviet Russia. That becomes the leading, the leading uh, 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 demand and the movement, and then it expresses it expresses a kind of sentiment. And of course, we know uh, from history one of the highlights of that moment that is the hands off the Soviet Russia was the was the uh, strike that took place in Seattle uh, in October of uh, 1919 when Longshoremen uh, refused to <coughs> load uh, freight uh, arms that were being sent to the counter-revolutionary revolutionary home. It was symptomatic. It was symptomatic of the kind of symptom. I forgot to mention that uh, uh, as soon as the Bolshevik Revolution happened, the foremost uh, social spokesperson in the United States uh, Eugene V. Debs declared himself, "I am a Bolshevik." Mm. This is what this is what Debs this is what Debs, uh, Debs said. Uh, so this was the, the this was the impact, the immediate impact of the revolution, and the, the lessons of it began to become increasingly uh, important. And the Bolsheviks, because of exactly what they did, for many people, it would become increasingly dissatisfied with the reality of the Socialist Party. That is a party that operated in the name of unity. That is, you bring together all kinds of different tendencies, very, very different kinds of positions, and, so on. and exactly because of this, they were not able to not able to offer uh, a kind of uh, uh, effective opposition to the. I failed to mention too that one of the things that happens in 1918, uh, uh, once the United States uh, decides to. Um, uh, to invade and to go after the Bolsheviks is the, the clampdown on civil liberties in space. Uh, the beginning, this is the beginning of a red scare in the United States. And the question of how you orient toward, toward that, that became one of the major issues. What is the effective way to be able to do with this attack on revolutionary, revolutionary forces? So, so out of that, out of the, the example, the Bolshevik example, uh, lessons are drawn. One, well, how did the Bolsheviks do this? Why were they successful? And so from that question, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the answer of having a revolutionary party, the kind of party that, that uh, Lenin had been advocating for, and uh, Lenin's famous insight in 1901, famous insight in 1901, <coughs> the prelude to what is to be done. And Lenin says that if you don't already have an organization, a revolutionary party in place, when the proverbial shit hits the fan, it's too late to try to form one. It's too late. The turbulence will not allow you to do that. 
and so that was the lesson that Lennon drew, and indeed, this is what I argue. It explains why of all of the various, ten remember there are various tendencies, various tendencies within uh, Russia, what explains the effectiveness of the Bolshevik tendency. And so that fact, success and so on, is what, what motivates the left wing, mainly the left wing of the Socialist Party, to try to emulate organizational organizationally what the Bolsheviks said. So that was the <coughs> first lesson. The second major lesson that I, my time is just about out, and we can take it up maybe during the discussion, is what I think I bring, if there's anything original I bring to the topic, that it was, that's a question about how you involve yourself in the electoral process, the electoral parliamentary process. This has always been a bugbear within the uh, socialist movement, uh, not only in this country, but elsewhere. And it was out of the reality of the problem of compromise, the reformism and so on. This is what gave anarcho-syndicalism a new lease on life, especially because of the ref you, I call it <coughs> going into the electoral parliamentary process is like going to the black hole. You go in one way as a revolutionary, but you come out on the other side completely transformed. Mm -hmm. And this is what the anarcho-syndicalism, this was the critique of the anarcho-syndicalists by getting involved in politics in the electoral arena. It's my argument is that for the first time, uh, the Bolshevik experience that, uh, showed the way, provided the way, how indeed revolutionaries can participate, can participate in the electoral parliamentary process without being, without being, uh, uh, coming out as reformists on the uh, other side. And I'll just end with what I think was perhaps the first example of this, the decision by the new Communist Party of the United States to run a candidate, to run for mayor of, of New York, get Lowe's uh, campaign in 1921. I haven't been able to look at the details of this, why that decision was made, was seen as a power. It was a debate within, within the new Communist Party. Do we come out of the underground? Do we, how public should we become and so on? That was a part of the debate. And so running a candidate, this was seen as a test. I think it's in 1921, I think it's not an accident because it's in 1920 at the common turn, it's at common turn, the, the second Congress of uh, the Communists and the National, where this question is, is discussed in great detail about how to use the electoral parliamentary process uh, without being compromised. So I'll end here. Great.